Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome our online audiences, our live stream audiences, and all those of you who watch the video later. This is uh, one maybe over 600 programs that we've done since the pandemic started. Uh, we use the facilities and the uh, excellent tech crew at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco to bring you as many intelligent authors as we could from anywhere in the world. And we have a great author tonight, Joe Weisberg. He's also the creator of The Americans, the television show. Um, and he has a book called Russia Upside Down, which is really going to turn upside down a lot of the ideas that we have about how we've dealt in our foreign policy with Russia. And it has, you know, uh, knock on effects in other countries as well. But we're going to focus on what the United States' foreign policy to Russia has been, how effective or ineffective it was. And Joe, thanks a lot for joining us here at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So... First, how did you get the idea to write something about this? I mean, obviously, you did a television show that was somewhat related. Um, so, but, but to write a serious foreign policy book. Uh, by the way, I also thought it was a very serious book about how to think more clearly. You have a lot of things in there about how you push yourself to think more clearly. We won't talk about that part of it. But it, it doubles as a book like that, which I thought was very fascinating. Yeah, so. thank you. I appreciate that. And I do see it that way as sort of a, mm -hmm. a book about how I learned to think more clearly. And, mm -hmm. you know, you always think you're thinking clearly, right? <laughs> always. <laughs> and then, always. And then you look back and you say, oh, I got that wrong. I got that wrong. And I got that wrong. Maybe mm -hmm. it was a little foggier than I than I thought. And this mm -hmm. book sort of explores that in my own in my own story. But uh, the way I came to write it is, is actually a little bit funny because I had written two novels. I made a TV show. Uh, I was not someone who you know, really would ever have thought about writing a serious book about foreign policy. And then uh, one day I had a call from, an, I had worked at the CIA for a few years in my mid-20s, mm -hmm. and I got a call from a friend who was still working there, and he asked me if I would come in and give a lecture. Mm -hmm. And I, first of all, I didn't know you could go give a lecture at the CIA. <laughs> I thought like, you know, once I left the CIA, I thought that was it. I thought you don't get through that gate again. <laughs> but uh, I, I thought the idea was sort of intriguing, and I thought about it a little bit, and I realized that for really a long time, I had been working on these ideas in my head mm -hmm. about the Soviet Union and about Russia. And they'd certainly found expression in the Americans. And also, I was going to say expression in a lot of conversations, but not really. It was really just expression in conversations that ran around with myself in my head. So mm -hmm. I had a lot to say. So I thought, OK, and I made an outline. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to talk about this and this and this. And I'm going to talk about it at the CIA, which is going to be interesting because I'm going to really challenge them. That's an organization built to battle the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. I'm going to go in there and say, that might not have been a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I called my friend back and said, OK, I'm ready to give the lecture. And he said, great, your topic is counterintelligence. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know anything about counterintelligence. I got this whole speech ready about the Soviet Union. He said, no, you can't give that speech. <laughs> so I realized I was very disappointed. And mm -hmm. I just started wandering around and thinking about it. And then I thought, you know, I do have the outline. Why don't I just make it a book? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, the genesis. Oh, well, thank you to the CIA. Yeah. Uh, Thanks to the CIA for some other things that they've done uh, for, for, you know, showing us how not to do certain things. Now, I, I think one of the things before we go any further is to understand that this is not against the U.S. policy. It's not saying, you know, we shouldn't have a foreign policy. We shouldn't have a CIA. But the question is, what do we do that's actually in our self-interest? And what do we do that actually is counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish? And like a lot of institutions, uh, you know, you... The leadership sometimes has personal agendas which, you know, have such a deep influence on what the outcome is because their goal isn't exactly our goal. Democracy's always had this problem because the, the, the people who set the goals keep changing. Whereas, whereas if you've got a dictatorship, you know, you can maybe keep the goal somewhat focused for a couple decades. So counterproductive. You talked about the CIA in the book in a very interesting way. Um, that a lot of the work 
is not too much different than the KGB, not uh, that the CIA spies on Americans, but the KGB would spy on the Russians and, and, and all these people were doing it and it was almost all useless information. So talk about the CIA's, you know, a lot of the things that go wrong in Russia, we also do, but not quite as badly. It's, it's, it's what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. Well, that, I hope that's a, not just our unclear thinking. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 know, I know exactly what you're saying. And I think it gets to the, you know, you're talking about how the, the leaders change and they have all sorts of different motivations. There's also a huge factor of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows about unintended con consequences, right? Be careful of unintended consequences. But it's not really enough to be aware of them. You have to really balance out if what you're doing is worthwhile. And I think that uh, spying is a really good example of that because the idea seems sound, mm -hmm. right? If you have an adversary, why don't you recruit some people who live in that country and maybe even work for that country and get information from them about what they're doing so you can do a better job fighting off that adversary. That makes sense. I, I sort of get that. Mm -hmm. But there's some pretty big unintended consequences, which is everybody knows you're doing it. Mm -hmm. You can't really keep that secret. It's well known. And it engenders enormous hostility in the country that you are spying on. And if you're the United States, that's a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. So then you have to do a balance. Is the information we're getting helping us enough to balance out all the hostility we're creating in the world? I would argue no. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that, you know, it's an interesting parallel, you know, when you're comparing to the KGB, um, the KGB did both internal spying on the Russian people and the exact same kind of external spying that the, that the CIA did. And I think the point you were making had to do with, a, you know, it's easier to compare apples to apples, but there is nevertheless a comparison to the internal spying they did, which is most of the KGB effort, resources, manpower was spent following, listening to, recruiting people from the Soviet Union to spy on their colleagues and people they worked with. And there's really very little reason to think any of it did any good. It was a giant bureaucratic effort that mostly had the unintended consequence of creating this kind of rift between the leadership and the people because the people felt spied on. Mm -hmm. For good reason. Yeah, it was happening, <laughs> right? It was happening. Yeah. So um, one of the historical things you talk about is the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. Now, we just had our own history with Afghanistan, uh, which seems incomprehensible after we caused the other problem back in the 70s. But in 1979, um, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. At the time, there was a communist government there, but it was, you know, it was starting to fall apart. So why don't you tell a little bit of the story about that? Yeah, it's a very, uh, this is for me personally, a very revealing story. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1979, I guess I was 14 mm -hmm. and I was following and interested in these issues, you know, not as much as I was later, but I understood the general, what was happening in the culture and how it was being discussed. And the kind of line of American politicians and American media was that the Soviets were going in there to spread communism, maybe to continue on and get warm water ports. It was all seen through the perspective of the evil communists are trying to spread their influence and conquer. Mm -hmm. And eventually, uh, you know, Politburo meeting notes came out. All kinds of people could be interviewed once the Soviet Union fell. That isn't what was happening, mm -hmm. right? As you said, there was a communist government. They were afraid of that government falling and the United States coming in and spreading American influence right on their border. Mm -hmm. So it was really more about being afraid. And the, the other great analogy that makes me think so much about us and how we act in general is that as the Politburo tried to decide whether or not to make this move, just like us with Vietnam, they knew that they were going to get into a quagmire. Mm -hmm. They talked about it. It was clear to a lot of them. And they kind of couldn't stop themselves because mm -hmm. of their anxiety over U.S. influence. They also, if you think about when we went into Afghanistan or Iraq, you know, you need to tell yourself certain stories to justify it. Mm -hmm. Here's one of the stories they told themselves. Our Central Asian republics in the Soviet Union are the most uh, kind of open Muslim societies in the world where women have complete equal rights. That's the way it should be. And if we go into Afghanistan, we can liberate the women of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Sound familiar? Sounds very familiar. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Course, and we know what happened, which was not that. Yeah. And it, I think it's, a, it's a, a great temptation to want to fix another person's culture. But at the same time, they're trying to fix yours. If you, you're, you're saying, you know, we have freedom in San Francisco that other people call debauchery. 
and, and think that it should be stopped. And it's not just people outside our country. Some people inside our country feel the same way. And this is a problem with freedom. There's a, a great study done by one of the uh, professors at Stanford on why Silicon Valley has been so productive. And they think it's the history of total freedom of the Bay Area for the last 150 mm. years. And you get a lot of scoundrels and you get a lot of crooks and you get a lot, but you also have the freedom that, that supplies creativity as well. Um, and so a free society may, may have a lot of downsides to it. And other people are going to point to those downsides if they don't want to have a free society. And their arguments are accurate, maybe to an extent, about some of those downsides. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the overall picture is against them. I mean, I think, and, and we're, we're in this conversation on the basis that a democratic future is, is where humanity is at least trying to head. And, and that's where we're trying to get. And we're not trying to say, don't have any foreign policy but just have a smart foreign policy so we can actually get there because right now what's been going on has been very counterproductive. So that period of time, I thought anyway, um, being 15 years older or so, uh, I thought that Zbigniew Brzezinski was, was kind of personally responsible for this decision. Um, he he was, had a Polish background, hated the Russians for all kinds of good reasons, wanted to stick it to them as the United States had just gotten stuck to them by the Russians and others in Vietnam. Um, and, and, and made a bet on the Mujahideen to do that. Uh, a very, very bad bet. A very bad bet with, yeah. with pretty tragic consequences. Yeah. There's a book that I recommend a lot by a, a former British ambassador to the Soviet Union. I think his name is Roderick Braithwaite, and it's called Afghansi. Mm -hmm. And he just tells the story of that war from the Soviet perspective, what a tragedy it was for the soldiers, just like our soldiers in Vietnam. You can't help but have your heart go out to them. Mm. And you really think about the role we played in so many of them getting killed mm -hmm. and injured. And you have to pull back and ask yourself, did we get some kind of geostrategic benefit from that that could remotely, you know, make it acceptable? I mean, you know, some people tell you to this day that it was fundamental to the collapse of the Soviet Union and that that was a good thing. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that the majority of experts who have really studied it think that. I think they mm -hmm. think it may have contributed a little bit, but the primary reasons the Soviet Union collapsed were internal problems, not so much related to that. But the book also, you know, details certain aspects of Soviet life that were a real shock to me. Um, for example, when a Soviet soldier was killed, he would generally be brought back home by a couple of people from his unit. And often they were, these, their coffins with their bodies and then were brought back to these little villages and towns where the people would surround the officers who had brought them back and sometimes started riots and physically attacked them. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't imagine that that could happen in the Soviet Union. I thought the level of control was so extreme that no one would ever dare do anything like that. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, for me, one of a lot of things I learned that sort of shattered this idea of kind of the totalitarian Soviet monolith, mm -hmm. which was, I think, a, a little bit of a story we told ourselves to help ourselves see them as bad mm -hmm. and us as good and them as evil and us as virtuous. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about what you said is, you know, this idea that we want a democratic future. And I think that's, of course, what we want for us. Mm -hmm. And we seem to have our hands full getting that <laughs> for us. So, you know, we can let other people do what they want to do. I remember when I first, you know, when, you know, back in, in that same era in the late seventies and mid eighties, I thought that Sakharov and Sharansky and the various, you know, dissidents and to some degree, maybe less the refuseniks, but the various dissidents, I thought they were not just the conscience of the Soviet people, but I thought that they had very broad based support mm -hmm. and that people couldn't admit that they liked them because they would go to jail and be, you know, repressed in various ways. And it was just, it so happened that those people thought exactly how we thought about mm -hmm. what a government should be like. That was incorrect. Mm -hmm. Those people had very little support in the Soviet Union. Um, that was not what people wanted. To this day, democracy doesn't have the sort of ring there that it has in our ears of being some obvious positive mm -hmm. value and system. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when people were, pretty free to say what they wanted, at least for a while, there was no outpouring of support for the dissidents. They weren't people's heroes at all. They were mm. marginal. You, you go into um, Gorbachev and, and the fact that he's a hero here and he's not a hero there. Um, that's another angle of the same thing and why. 
and then, and then why Putin uh, is a hero. So why don't, why don't we talk about Mikhail Gorbachev? Um, yeah. I, wrote, I wrote him a letter uh, in, in uh, 89 when the wall came down in Berlin. And I said, okay, here's your opportunity. Go to the UN, give a speech, and in the speech say, we Russians are extremists. Now, we took this idea of Karl Marx to an extreme. He was talking about what's going to go wrong with capitalism unfettered. Um, and, and there were lots of problems with that. Uh, we went to the other extreme. But the result of you reacting to this is the social wel welfare democracies that you have in Europe and America. And that is a sustainable form which didn't exist before. So we should be thanked for being on this extreme while you were on that extreme so that we all ended up at this place, which is sustainable. And that was... He, of course, didn't do it. But yeah, but that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly historically accurate. You know, if you're living here in America and you've grown up more or less than we did and there are the sort of social benefits of the social welfare state to some degree, obviously much more in Europe, but not mm. absent here. You don't I mean, you don't think about was there a time when this didn't happen? Where did this mm -hmm. come from? You just think, obviously, we had some ideas to try to be more just and fair states. But it really was a consequence of what you're what you're talking about. Yeah. And Gorbachev was such a, a fascinating guy. I think hard for Americans, myself included, to get our to wrap our minds around because he was so obviously extremely decent, humane mm -hmm. person. He was just a, you know, a good person with good values apart from Mm -hmm. politics or anything else. And he was a very committed communist. Right. Right. He believed in his heart and soul in the system he had grown up in. And he wanted to reform it and fix it, which was, that was a good idea. It mm. needed to be reformed and fixed. Obviously, that did not work out. Yeah. He was uh, like the Thomas More and Erasmus of the Catholic Church. Uh, they tried to re reform it and then Luther came in and <laughs> that was the end of that. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so, uh, in, in Gorbachev. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was going to say one more thing oh, yeah, in response ahead. to your question, which is that we tend here to see him as a kind of a heroic figure because we relate to the sides of him that wanted freedom and openness and really did create that in the mm. latter years of the Soviet Union to such a substantial agree, degree. So we focus on that and think this is a great man and a hero. But he's not. He was not popular. I mean, for a little while he was popular. He did not end up popular in the Soviet Union. He's not popular in Russia because, of course, from, from their perspective, what is his single greatest legacy? The collapse of their country. Mm -hmm. Of course they don't like him. Right. Exactly. He's got like 1% approval rating, <laughs> something like that. Right. Um, so you, you talk about how Putin then, I mean, the Yeltsin period is a fairly short uh, period and, and uh, all, all full of problems. Um, but Putin came and was understood by the people, uh, and he played right into this, um, of being the leader who will put things back together. Now, they see that, that that's what he did. And his popularity is the obverse of Gorbachev's unpopularity because of that. So why don't you explain a little bit about that? Well, I think you, you said it very well. You know, the Yeltsin years were an ongoing disaster, mm -hmm. economic, social People were, you know, people, it had not been a well-off country in the first place, and it got a lot worse. Crime was rampant. The mafia was incredibly powerful to a degree we can't really, I don't think, understand in the United States. You know, people were starting to talk about the possibility of Russia becoming a mafia-controlled nuclear state. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was bad. And Putin came in, and he essentially successfully restored a level of stability. It's not that he got rid of the mafia. It's not that he made everything in the country great. It's not that the economy suddenly became fantastic, but the economy stabilized and got better. The crime was gotten under a degree of control. Federal authority was reasserted. Essentially, it became, again, a coherent state mm -hmm. that had been really teetering. And again, as Amer it's at least until recently, I mean, as recently as when I started writing this book, mm -hmm. it was very hard as an American to relate to the idea of being in a teetering state, mm -hmm. right? Because our state has been really stable for a long time. But if you think about it, do try to put yourself in that position. And again, I'm not quite saying we're teetering now, but we're mm -hmm. closer to teetering. So it's probably a little easier to get it. <laughs> it's not strange that your number one uh, goal and value would be stability. Yeah. I, I, I think of El Salvador in the 80s there. The, uh there had been a war there for such a long period of time. We finally arranged for elections and everybody was so upset because uh, they voted in a military uh, government, uh, very right wing, 80% of the vote. 
And, and all the Americans going, what are you doing? But the reason is because they had just been in a war and it was chaos for that long. That's all they wanted. You know, the middle, the middle of the political spectrum is comfortable if you can get there from either extreme slowly. Um, but if you're near chaos, you, you, you go to the other extreme. I mean, I think that's human history. There's just like no, no other choice. You know, it's interesting is, as you and I talk about it, it sounds, it sounds quite obvious. Yeah. And in fact, I think to <laughs> us, it is obvious. Yeah. But I don't have to look back too far in my own life to a time when it wasn't obvious. Mm -hmm. So I asked myself, what was, what was blocking me? What kept me from seeing these sort of really f pretty basic things about human nature? And I, I just ultimately think that my own need to view both myself personally and our country as superior mm -hmm. and as virtuous and is good was so powerful. And then at the same time, if that was me and that was us, mm -hmm. right? Then if the other side was, it's just a black and white situation. The other side was the opposite. They were mm -hmm. evil and bad and malign. Then I could fight them. And mm -hmm. that also gave me a purpose in my life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was very, I think kind of unsophisticated way of viewing the world. And as I sort of hint in the title of my book, kind of upside down, mm -hmm. but boy, I, I thought and felt that way for a long, long time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so much easier black and white than it is. Uh, we're light gray and they're medium gray. And this one over here is a little darker gray. Well, that, and we reserve this for North Korea, et cetera, right. et cetera. You know, right. you just uh, look at it. You don't know, actually, it's an emotional thing. You don't have a set of standards. If somebody enslaves their people, kind of everybody goes to the extreme and say, that's, that's way too much. And I think the fact that the communist governments in the Soviet Union uh, like that wouldn't let any of their people travel outside the country was close to a, a form of enslavement and people looked at it that way. Once that's gone, you make the great point, you know, we wanted Russia to become uh, more uh, Christian, more open, more democratic. And that's what they did. And then we didn't like them anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. And more capitalist, right? Yeah. yeah more capitalist. All <laughs> well, the things yeah. we wanted to do, they did. And we don't like them. <laughs> you know, it, 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 I, I often feel uh, about Russia and the way other people, other Europeans and Americans treat them. Yeah. The way, you know, in a big family, you know, the youngest in the family, right? So the youngest in the family, it's like, when are you going to treat me as an adult? You know, when, when are you going to, and, and I think Peter the Great, even when he started and he created uh, St. Petersburg was trying to say, we're, we're European, we're European. And I, I feel very strongly that, that Putin with the, the uh, Winter Olympics at Sochi was trying to, he was putting on a big show, but he was trying to say, look, we're Europeans. Look at all, everything that we contributed. And he focused on 19th century stuff, all their ballet, all the great music from the 19th century, their authors. Right. We, this is who we are. Look at us this way. Forget about those 75 years we were communist. Right, right, right. You know, but nobody bought. Nobody bought that thing, just like they didn't buy Peter the Great. It's frustrating. And it was the next year that he took Crimea. I, I, really, I really feel that this is like a lost opportunity. Yeah, yeah. All we would have had to say is, yeah, Russia's great, and we love your music. We love your <laughs> authors. We're going we're gonna to keep them in our universities for the next thousand years. No question yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. You know, yeah. it, it's... Uh, you know, the, the, the sort of political version of what you're talking about that runs exactly parallel and is the same is that when Putin came to power, it seems, it's hard to know for sure, but it seems very likely that he was fairly open to the West. Mm -hmm. Whatever his background was in the Soviet Union and the KGB and the way he had grown up and everything else, when he came to power, he seemed to want a degree of economic cooperation so that he could have trade and help his economy. Mm. And of course, it's sort of a famous story, but he was incredibly emotionally, openly supportive of us after September 11, mm -hmm. you know, in part because he was in a war in Chechnya and wanted a kind of, you know, global consensus about terrorism. Mm -hmm. But so what? That's, that's, <laughs> that's valid. Right. And, you know, you, you could sort of track it over the years as that openness shut down and mm -hmm. he became more and more, I think, got the feeling that you're describing of, I, I, I can't, we can't win. We mm -hmm. can't win with the West. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, one of the things I do in the book is try to kind of list the things we did mm -hmm. to move him in that direction. Not to say that it was all our fault right. and not to say, cause it was a back and forth, a tit for tat that has been going on since even before the Soviet era, really, but mm -hmm. certainly throughout the cold war. But you know, the best example is that, we started expanding NATO eastward 
after mm-hmm. the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's a little bit unclear. Probably we promised not to, but I'm not sure that even matters. Mm-hmm. We started taking former Warsaw Pact nations into the NATO. Mm-hmm. After Putin took over, we started taking former Soviet republics into our defense alliance forged to fight the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. How were they supposed to feel? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and then you even look at their own history of being run over and destroyed so many times, they're starting, they start to feel encircled. Mm-hmm. I would too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the only thing that they can do under those circumstances is say, you know, come and get us in the winter. <laughs> that's, that's when we win. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We still got the winter. Um, you mentioned, and, and it's been mentioned plenty of times when we've had some things on here about the Cuban Missile Crisis and everything, but I think it still bears repeating that, that we had missiles in Turkey before they had missiles in Cuba. And, you know, it might have looked fairly similar to them and they might have felt, okay, that's where we should go next. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, right. I bet that wasn't in your high school history textbook. I don't think when you learned about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's so it's just literally just cutting out Mm -hmm. what we did that either provoked it or at least played our share. Uh, We had a a guy who uh, wrote a book on JFK. And and, uh, one of the things he mentioned was that JFK... And the Cuban Missile Crisis took place in a year uh, in, in the uh, just before the midterm elections. And Kennedy was worried about the midterm elections. And there was a, a, a letter from him to Khrushchev saying, uh, I, I know you have certain plans and stuff like that. Could you please postpone them until after the midterm elections? And you think, <laughs> uh, you know, whatever else you think about that, you think, as a negotiator of deals and stuff like that, that's not the stupidest thing you could possibly do <laughs> is tell your, the guy who's your opponent, take it easy on me until after the midterm elections because I need your help. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the, there's all kinds of little things like that. But you, you, you mentioned also that we, we sent a lot of uh, planes right along the edge and buzzed them and, you know, and tried to irritate them. And it, and it really does seem just like, you know, two children's games trying to hit each other in the nose with their finger t- fingers or something like that. that, that there was that, so much of that. It all, that's a particularly interesting piece of the story to me because and I don't think many people know about it. I don't mean that I discovered it. There have been right. some books and some things written about it, but it's really was never mentioned in any course I read or almost any article I ever read that throughout the Cold War, we think about the U-2s, right? We right. know that we sent U-2s over and we know what happened. But it was a lot more than U-2s. There were spy planes, you know, going near the territory, over the territory, and getting shot down with some regularity. Something like 100 U.S. airmen were killed mm-hmm. after their surveillance planes were shot down during the Cold War. I, some of them were over China, but I think the vast majority were around the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. And then the most shocking part of the story is that Reagan... Uh, on more than one occasion, sent these planes to sort of buzz and try to intimidate the Soviet leadership to try to influence their actions, just to kind mm-hmm. of shake them up, which is really pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. And again, how would you? How would you? How would we have felt if there were Soviet spy planes flying regularly over the United States and we didn't have the ability to shoot them down? Mm-hmm. So we were just sort of had to had to take it. Right. That changed. They did get the ability to shoot them down eventually, but. Yeah. In, Pretty in provocative. Nature. Very provocative. Um, and, and some of the other comparisons you do, uh, I think, are also great. I mean, you, you talk about whether Putin is a murderer because of the poisonings. And you, you go through several of the things, and we'll, we'll let those people who want all the details take it from the book. Um, but the, the poisonings are famous, but the poisonings kill one or two people. And there have been a couple of uh, collateral damage, uh, you know, happenings there. Um, but the drones that we use to, to uh, kill people that are our enemies, uh, that's different. You know, be, but, but there's more, much more collateral damage, actually. Yeah and, yeah. and I was thinking about it because you had mentioned this thing about flying over and stuff like that. I think our, our method, the, the poison seems so human. <laughs> I hate to say it. But it just seems like such a human level uh, attack on your enemy. It's been around, you know, forever. Um, but the drones feel very alien. You know, there's nobody in it. Somebody in the Las Vegas desert is piloting it wherever it is in the world, you know, that kind of thing. And you would think that the people on the ground would think of us not much different than the movies we produce uh, in Hollywood where the aliens come and, and, you know, they want to eat us, basically. Well, you know, the thing the thing that people typically jump up and say is that Putin is uh, responsible for killing people that it's unconscionable, Mm. whereas we are targeting people who are true enemies of the United States, terrorists and things like that. But as you're pointing out, 
the collateral damage where we miss and hit a wedding, we're, we're killing completely innocent people and it's so predictable that that will happen that mm -hmm. we can't really absolve ourselves of any responsibility. You know, the, the question I ask is, you know, is there's a sort of a, not just a common or mainstream consensus that Putin should be seen as a killer, but people really have openly said it, important mm -hmm. American politicians have openly said it many, many times, the man's a killer. and. He has killed people, so technically that's correct. I, I can't say the man is not a killer, right. nor do I want to deny the horror, the moral, emotional, and personal horror of what he's doing, which is terrible. But if you reduce him to that, mm -hmm. if you say that that is fundamentally so much the fundamental core of who he is that we should just think of him as a killer, I think you miss the boat. Mm -hmm. And the analogy, you know, I've been using this analogy for a while, I said recently that I, it's, my analogies are not intended to be perfect. You know, <laughs> I, I'm not, they're just intended to sort of get you to think. I said to somebody, so this is about a 10% good analogy. And they told me later, no, it's a 30% good analogy. Good. So I may have to <laughs> knock my own perception of my analogies up. But it's like if you just said that George Bush was a torturer. Mm -hmm. That's who he was. The man's a torturer. Right. He's beyond the pale. He's a torturer. Well, he is a torturer. Right. I mean, he is responsible for a significant degree of torture and needs to be held accountable for that, just like Putin needs to be held accountable for the murders he's committed. But if that's all you see in George Bush, mm -hmm. you're not seen with a very wide lens. Right. Right. Um, and it's interesting how you presented it, because it's kind of hard to tell what shade of gray they are compared to us and differently. We, we can tell from uh, economic productivity that they're a deeper shade of gray. There's no question about that, that our system is more productive. Mm -hmm. uh, from a scientific point of view, we have, the, but, but the Russians have done all kinds of great science as well. And so on that, we're, we're a lot closer, etc. cetera. And you could, you could pick out the different things and say, at least this civilization is one that we should be able to deal with. If we can't deal with them, who used to be our enemy, you know, um, we did it with Germany and Japan after World War II, and that was a total success. Well, and if you, the Germans don't behave exactly like we do, the Japanese don't behave exactly like we do, but you can't say that that wasn't a big success in our foreign policy, probably one of the smartest things we did. Yeah. And we might've got pushed into it, there might've been a few good ideas, and there might've been reasons that were just the usual politics that made that work, probably. But even so, it should've taught us something. I really agree with that, the sort mm -hmm. of common perception in American political circles that, as I said, Russia is beyond the pale, mm. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it comes from this same uh, point of view that in order to believe in our own virtuousness, mm -hmm. we have to have somebody out there who we see as the bad guy. It, it's a very sort of a, uh, it's almost, I don't want to call it a childish way of thinking because it's also a very adult way of thinking, <laughs> but it's not a, it's not a thoughtful way of, yeah. way of looking at the world. And our conflicts with Russia what, what are they really about? I mean, we could come up with some things that are genuine conflicts, but they're not like, at least in the original Cold War, at least we had a huge conflict about our systems and we each thought ours was better and we each wanted to spread ours to a certain degree. I at least understand that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was necessary either, but it makes a, a lot of sense in terms of human nature. But what we are fighting with Russia about right now to such a, to such a degree where there's this level of animosity I, is beyond me. It's a little like, baseball and soccer arguing about which one's, you know, <laughs> better, you know, you yeah. know, the, the only sport that should survive. Right. Well, the Americans love baseball and soccer is loved uh, in the rest of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Right, right. Can't we just enjoy the sport? You know, it's a, it, as long as it's in some range of acceptable behavior, you know, yeah. I mean, semi-acceptable behavior. We can't set the bar too high for humanity. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and also, why do, we, why do we have to compare so much? I mean, the impulse yeah. to compare is so strong. Almost whenever I talk about this topic, people start to say to me, well, yes, okay, what you're saying there is true about the United States, but Russia this and Russia that. Mm -hmm. What's that? You know, I, I said to a person the other day that if you happen to be at a point in your life where you are choosing which country to live in, mm -hmm. that makes sense <laughs> to have a big discussion and think a lot about which country is better because you're going to live there. You want to see where you're going to be happier and have a better life. Yeah. Absent that, it is not a competition between the United States and Russia and the competition partly serves, I think, to help us avoid facing our own problems. I did that on a personal level. All those years when I was younger and so focused on the Soviet Union, that I was not focused on America. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I was almost, I was making a pretty unconscious decision to not worry about myself and my country by projecting all the problems over there. Well, uh, when I was reading your book about that, um, your, your statements in that area, I thought of Plato and the, the Republic because he created this Republic. And I, I think, you know, almost nobody wants to live there, right? <laughs> um, and, but I think basically he was uh, trying to create a society in which he would feel comfortable, right? right? And, and you'd say, okay, Who's well, you're very there, orderly right? and so on and so forth. But that's the same, same old, same old Plato, you know? Uh, so why don't you get comfortable in yourself and then, and then you know, stop trying to change the rest of humanity? There, there's things at the edges that obviously almost everybody agrees we can't accept uh, a certain kind of behavior. But almost everything else has been accepted at one time or even lauded or praised or put on the pedestal, you know, at some time or another in the last 5,000 years. Um, and I, I think if we're, if we're going to move towards democracy and really decentralize, you know, things without getting to chaos, that's, that's what the basis of it will be to say, we really don't, it really doesn't matter what our neighbor five blocks away does at all, period. You know, as long as they're not, you know, uh, theft and murder and rape, right. you know, something like that. Right. And, and all those are violating our free wills. But I think we, it's, a, it's a leftover from our idea that everybody's an object, you know, and it, 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 all those objects should fit into our worldview and do what we want them to do. Well, it doesn't work in a marriage. It doesn't work with your children. It, you know, it, that doesn't work at all. Um, and yet we, we haven't figured that one out either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, in very, I'm on extremely not firm ground when I talk about Plato, but I'll, I'll jump in and do it anyway, mm-hmm. that if you're a philosopher and you start pitching a system where the philosophers are in charge, yeah. that's a big warning sign. <laughs> right? That's a big warning sign. You really should you know, take a look at that. And, and I think that all of us would probably, I know that it has served me well to kind of pull back. You know, there's a lot of great work being done where, uh, on the issue of where do our political belief systems come from. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jonathan Haidt writes very, uh, right. I think, effectively about this, that we think our political beliefs come from a sober analysis of the facts and reason and logic, and therefore we are right about them, Mm. but they don't. They come from our emotions and our feelings and our predilections and the way we grew up and our relationships and everything else. That's where our political beliefs come from. And then, then we get all the ideas and the facts and everything that we think support that. Mm -hmm. And if you can sort of understand it more in those terms, it's easier. I found it easier to pull away Mm-hmm. From the from the very seductive idea that I'm right mm-hmm. and people who disagree with me are wrong, mm-hmm. and instead, you know, try to live in a world where it's not that I'm right; it's that I have some beliefs and views that come out of my own internal logic and system, and so do they, and we ought to respect each other. Well, I think part of the issue and this is back in America again uh, of the division that people keep talking about in America between red and blue states and all that kind of stuff, and and the the social media exacerbating it. Um, is is that the social media plays off those emotional part of it as opposed to the ideas part of it? I think you could you could change the ideas of both sides, and they would hardly notice. That's right. They'd you know, be just the as fight, happy. The fight would still be going on. And the, the the other thing is, you know, that I don't think that the division is anywhere near as strong. I know a lot of the states it's close to fifty fifty, and so even even where it's a red state, it's it's still not a hundred percent or even anywhere close to that. And uh, it, it, most of those things that people are disagreeing about are fairly peripheral issues. Everyone kind of agrees. I mean, defund the police started for a while and then, you know, it's, it's, it's backed off and, and uh, people didn't pay attention to the sophistication of the idea. They thought that it meant take away all the money from the police. Obviously, that's a stupid idea. But, but to take some of their job and move it to somebody else who might be able to do that job better you know, that's, that, that might work, at least, at least worth an experiment, right? Yeah, uh, you know, really, yeah. I, I agree with that. It really makes me think, again, to the Cold War, mm-hmm. right? Because in the Cold War, we, we were just divided. There was us and they, there was them, and they were wrong and we were right. And then the Cold War ended, and it just seems like all that way of being in the world just transferred here, Mm -hmm. and instead of an external enemy, we all got internal enemies. Mm -hmm. So we divided into two sides. This time, they're both in our country instead of one, a different country. And everybody on each side, not everybody, but the general feeling on each side, they're completely right, they're good, they're virtuous, the other side is the opposite of Mm -hmm. all those things. And, you know, there's there's just a, 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 a kind of a lack of nuance and lack of 
lack of understanding that these things are gray. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, in, that in, and I'll tell you a sign that really stood out to me that made me realize how similar it is, is that in America right now, each side is constantly accusing the other one of lying, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what we felt about the Soviet Union right. and what they felt about us. Liars, liars, liars. And it wasn't they didn't lie and we didn't lie sometimes. <laughs> and it's not now like there isn't some lying going on. But I thought myself, for example, mm -hmm. if you'd looked at the Soviet leadership, that they were all complete cynics, that mm -hmm. they just wanted to hold on to power, mm -hmm. that everything they said about human rights, for example, was a disingenuous lie. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all wrong. Mm -hmm. That's just all wrong. We, it's just absolutely apparent now mm -hmm. that the vast majority of the Soviet leadership were passionate believers in their system. Mm -hmm. And they weren't, it's not that they never lied, but a lot of things I thought were lies were just different ways of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their feelings about what constituted human rights were reasonable and valid and just some, just skewed somewhat differently from ours. So mm -hmm. I, I would say the same thing here. If you can't get past the idea that the other, if you think the other people couldn't possibly really believe what they're saying, mm -hmm. you better think again. I and mean, there's all kinds of institutions that have been taking a hit, uh, religious institutions and others, for almost exactly the same thing. And almost all the people in those institutions and the leadership tend to believe in what they're doing up to at least a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, right. But then they try to protect the institution, et cetera, et cetera, which gets them in serious trouble for good reason. Yeah. Which uh, institutions are, you sound like you're referring to specific ones. Well, I was thinking the Catholic Church, uh -huh. you know, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But, but I think that there are uh, corporations, uh, Enron, a good example, and stuff like that. So a lot of people think that all major corporations are, are evil. Right. Right. You know, but most of them are run by middle managers uh, who, who are very concerned about their career right. and are not going to do anything wrong. If you, if you run a small company, it's much easier to cheat hmm. than it is in, in a major corporation. But if the leaders of a corporation are, are, are cheaters, then then they hire people who are like that. And the whole thing, you know, goes off the deep end and, interesting. and everybody points to it and says, yeah, that's the way they all are. That's what corporate America. That's is. what it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the same thing as if. Uh, as if all institutions have that problem. And it seems to me that, you know, a part of the argument about any institution is it can't get too big. But it just, one thing we have learned is the balance of powers, you know, between institutions mm -hmm. in our government. And I think there's a balance of power between, say, institutions that are designed for spiritual and religious ends and ones that are designed for economic ends and ones that are designed for political ends, government ends, and, and artistic ends. And we have to have big ones of each of those to play off each other so that, so that there's not just big governments making all the decisions, uh, uninfluenced by all these other issues that are part of human life. Right, right, right. It's another way of balancing powers. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's interesting. And, you know, when you're talking about it, I was thinking how the, the part of the temptation of having the more simplistic view of it, mm -hmm. more black and white view, is it really reduces anxiety, mm -hmm. right? If the world is black and white and simple and you can understand it, you feel less anxious because you, you think you know what's going on and you think you have a better idea how to make your way in the world. If the world is really complex and ultimately maybe you can understand some pieces or you can understand this or understand that and you might have to change your mind tomorrow, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very anxious way to live and you may not know what to do and you may not know what to think and you may not know what to say. You know, uh, Masha Gessen, by the way, writes about that as a, uh, you know, one of the appeals of autocracy, mm -hmm. that if the leadership really just tells you what to do and makes things simpler for your life, you don't have to be as anxious. And mm -hmm. that's very appealing. Now, there are some um, immigrants from the Soviet Union that came here in the middle of communism, and they were anxious by our department stores and our, our right. grocery stores because there's just too many choices. So it's, a, it's a habit. Yeah. But let, now that we've set the stage, I want you to completely blow uh, people's minds with some of the, the stories about how different the Soviet Union was from what you think. Yeah. The example I want you to talk about is, is the legal system, which is full of problems, but their humane execution system. I think people should know that. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you asked about that. Uh, you know, I know you're an attorney, and I really have never been asked about that. Oh. I had to be talking to an attorney for somebody <laughs> to be as interested in that. And it's such an interesting uh, facet of the, of the Soviet experience because... Um, I'll tell you, for example, I had always assumed that if you, if the Soviet, if the Soviet authorities thought that you were a traitor, mm -hmm. you know, you were working for the CIA or something like that, I always assumed they grabbed you, mm 
brought you to a prison and shot you in the back of the head. Mm -hmm. That was not how it worked. Mm -hmm. They, you had a very complex trial with a lot, you know, the system was different and and the investigative work was really done beforehand. So the trial was kind of a foregone conclusion, Mm -hmm. but the investigative work was for real. Mm -hmm. And they had spies, they had traitors who they were like, 95% 95% sure were traitors and we, and were mm-hmm. right. We know now they were who were not executed mm-hmm. because they weren't 100% positive. They were incredibly rigorous and, and serious about it, which was an absolute revelation to me. Once you think about it, it's not surprising. They were human beings too. Mm-hmm. But if you had this view of them as kind of just these black and white characters, then it is surprising. Anyway, I read a book, um, there's a guy named Sergei Kostin, who was mm-hmm. our consultant on the Americans, and he wrote an incredible book about a Soviet man who had spied for the French. And he did, after the guy got caught, he had this whole investigative process. They weren't, they couldn't prove it, essentially, so he went to jail. Eventually, I think they sent someone to be in the cell with him who he confessed to, mm-hmm. and then they had the goods, and he was executed. And Sergei describes the process of execution which was common. It was not just this guy. This was Mm -hmm. how they, at that period, at least this was how most of their executions were done. They had a special team, which was an execution squad. And really nobody in the Soviet Union knew that that, that these execution squads existed. Mm -hmm. So that's important. They would come to the person, if the person was sentenced to death, they could appeal. Mm -hmm. And the appeal was real and sometimes granted. But if the appeal was not granted, they would come to the person and say, we have to move you to like a different cell. Mm-hmm. You know, make it sound like some, you know, bureaucratic thing. And they would, then the person, one or two people would guide this person down to the basement or wherever it was. And waiting for them there would be a kind of magistrate type figure or, mm-hmm. or an official. And the official would say, um, your appeal has been rejected. Your sentence will be carried out shortly. And right then they would be shot in the back of the head by someone from the execution squad. Mm-hmm. And this was all put together to try to be humane. Mm -hmm. They didn't want people to suffer with the knowledge that they were going to be executed. If you think about our system where people can spend years in anxiety knowing they're going to be executed. Now, everything about it wasn't humane, right? The the families often weren't told that they had been killed. They weren't told where they were buried. I'm not trying to promote it overall. But it was such a surprise to me that they would go to that level of trouble Mm -hmm. to try to essentially protect the psyches of the people that they were going to execute. I was very right. struck by that. Another thing that you said, which I think was very interesting, also very good for the background of uh, Vladimir Putin, is that the KGB is one of the more honest institutions in the Soviet Union and that yeah. they pride themselves on their honesty and directness. Why don't you tell about that? Because that's not what people think. <laughs> no, and, and certainly wasn't what I thought. You know, my Cold War view was that Soviet Union was an evil empire, and the KGB was like the number one instrument of the evil part, mm-hmm. right? That everything they did with you know, the people who worked there were sort of, bl- you know, bloodthirsty automatons who mm-hmm. would do anything and had no conscience, and everything the organization did was rotten. Um, if you studied the Soviet Union at all, you know that there was a lot of corruption. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the economy was not exactly functional. That's maybe... Uh, too simplistic to say, but the economy was so riddled with problems that there was a very active black market and a lot of things got done through bribery and corruption and whatnot. And of course, the Russian empire before the Soviet Union struggled mightily with corruption. We struggle mightily with corruption, it needs to also be said, but they Mm. were on a level that would be probably hard for most Americans to quite relate to. Darker gray, yes. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. A darker gray. A darker gray. (laughs) So, um, anyway, the, uh, the, the, um, the fundamental way that the, uh, that the corruption worked was, you know, s- sorry, I lost my train of thought. What was no, the- You're going to talk about the KGB not oh, being Oh, right, right, right. So this affected the Communist Party mm-hmm. and, s- and, and the government organizations and, and, and just top to bottom, the whole country. Well, interestingly enough, the KGB was, although it had some corruption, mm-hmm. fundamentally wasn't very corrupt. Mm-hmm. It really, f- it had a lot of esprit de corps and people kind of believed in it and wanted to serve there because they were, wanted to be and succeeded to a substantial degree in being above that. And the, and the, there's a great story that uh, kind of explains this a little bit that I uh, read about in a book by a Canadian academic about how under Andropov, the KGB took on the Moscow City Grocers Association mm-hmm. because 
that they were responsible for all the food distribution. And because that's a lot of power, mm -hmm. they were highly, con the food grocers were connected to all the people in the Communist Party. They could give people food. They could mm -hmm. get all the great fresh food and everything else. They had a surprising mm -hmm. amount of power. But you would think the KGB could crush them, mm -hmm. right? It was the KGB. Well, what actually happened was the KGB spent years fighting the grocers and the KGB lost. Mm -hmm. The KGB lost. They were not able to do anything to curtail the corruption and the Communist Party eventually, you know, forced the KGB to, to shut it down more or less. So Andropov essentially realized what a threat corruption was, that it could really play a part in destroying the country, mm -hmm. tried to do something about it through the arm of the KGB and failed. And failed. Uh, another thing that you talk about uh, is that the leaders of the Soviet Union, including Stalin, were all relatively poor people uh, that got ahead in a meritocratic way. Not exactly how we would think about things. No, it's, it's interesting, isn't yeah. it? You know, the, the you make the great point. You make the great point that if it had lasted long enough, they probably would start getting their children in the way you know, it was done in many, all, all other societies, as you say. But in this case, at least the whole leaders all the way through uh, Yeltsin and, and, and Putin as well. Yeah. Well, everybody. Everybody, you know, in the Soviet era, all the leaders essentially had various versions of, you know, peasant backgrounds. I mm. don't think Andrew Rose's family were exactly peasants, but I think they were very poor. Mm -hmm. Everybody was poor and they all rose up. And in my earlier perception as a cold warrior, the way you got to be the leader of the Soviet Union was by being bloodthirsty, by being corrupt, by being cynical, by being able to, you know, work a political system in a kind of nefarious way. That's not... Right. You know, really, these guys were all really smart and really talented and really good with people. They weren't all the same. They mm -hmm. had, you know, like any leaders here or anywhere else, they had different skill sets in that area, but they were not dummies. You mm -hmm. know, when I was growing up, they were the, the, the leaders, the people running the country were so old mm -hmm. and, and they were sort of falling apart health wise. And it was easy to have that become the perception of really what they were like. Mm -hmm. But take Brezhnev, for example, who was a younger man, was you know, very smart, very well liked, very good at getting people to work together and get along with each other. Very idealistic, wanted to play a big role in promoting world peace. Mm -hmm. You know, compared to, that, to the Brezhnev of his final years, he's hardly recognizable. So obviously right. he stayed in power too long. Yeah, I, I just think those were all fascinating looks at, at how different it was um, from what we perceive it to be. On the other hand, of course, they, all, all the things that, that uh, we are upset about about the Soviet Union also are all accurate. And I think it's important to, to, to hold both of those things at the same time, you know? And, and, and then I think they begin to look human. <laughs> yeah. I, I want that we can deal with this. You know? I, I want to second that because I, I went to great pains in my book to make it clear that all the nasty and dark sides were true mm. and accurate and our general perception of those was correct. Mm. The problem was that we perceived it as the whole picture. Sometimes when I'm in my enthusiasm in talking about it, I forget to mention that. So I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. I don't want to be seen in any way as denying that. It's what yeah. you say. It's people are complex and we're complex. Yeah, there's nothing naive in your book. And I think that that's that's one of the great things about it, because um, we're here in the world and we have this plan. Like you said, what is the what is the United States foreign policy about? Are we are we just trying to prove we're superior to other countries? Well, we can do that, uh, but we can even even with that sort of silly motivation, uh, we we could still be much smarter um, than we are about going about doing that. But if we're really trying to to make the world a slightly better place for people outside of our country, while we're making our, the world a better place for the people inside of our country, partially we're we're projecting outwards what we should be doing inwards, right? And, and we know all about that, and uh, it's. Uh, a comparable situation today is in China with the Uyghurs. You know, uh, they're, they're being clearly molested, but they're being molested in a way which is almost identical. We had a speaker in here just a couple of weeks ago, um, Margaret Jacobs, almost identical to what we did to the American Indians 100 years ago. We want that land. We want this situation. Uh, you're a small part of the population. You're in our way. We can pretend we're doing things in a nice way, but really what we're doing is even if we don't kill you directly, we're trying to take away your culture and make, make you assimilate and absorb into, into our culture. It's interesting because we let the Amish, you know, a small enough group, uh, do what their thing. Um, the Mormons have gotten into a very big group 
but they were out in Utah for the first 50 years when Utah was forever and away, away from everybody else. <laughs> right. and, and therefore, um, their timing was perfect because when they were in Illinois, they weren't going to survive. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do a Russian example of what you were saying about China, mm -hmm. which is that I feel there are all these things where we just have to look at ourselves and we were doing the same thing just a little bit earlier. And who cares right. when? So, for example, if you look at gay rights in Russia, mm -hmm. Some of the things that are being done are unconscionable mm -hmm. and they shouldn't be done and we should be against it. But we did them. We, we were the same. And it wasn't very long ago that we were the same. And by the way, believe me, we're not altogether not the same now either. Right. right? So then the question becomes, what, how do we approach it? How do we approach it? Well, my position is that as individuals, as private citizens, it's good to speak out against it for private organizations that promote, for example, gay rights, it's very important. They, they have a, the main role in speaking out against that and trying to push things in the other mm -hmm. direction with whatever pretty limited influence they will have. I don't think it's the role of the government. Mm -hmm. I think when our government starts doing stuff like that, they create an enormous amount of conflict. It doesn't really accomplish anything. I, I don't deny that once in a while, if you go back to the Soviet times, once in a while there might, some good things might have happened, mm -hmm. happened from the, our government being very critical of them. But overall, it's very destructive and creates mm -hmm. a lot of resentment. And the government's job, I think, should be more to create peace and avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. and, they don't, it does, our gov and our government doesn't have to play the role of saying, you're bad, you're bad to another country. Mm -hmm. So the main way we can accomplish positive things in the world. First of all, you have to realize your limitations. Right. We're not going to be able to change another country. Second of all, private individuals and organizations speak out. And then finally, and of course, I'm hardly the, I'm one in a, I'm the millionth person to say this, but lead by example, yeah. you know, which is the same as focus on yourself. That's, that's Make yourself hard, better. Hardest thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, but, you know, we're, we're a lot like someone who stopped smoking last week, <laughs> you know, and, and now tells everybody how terrible it is that you smoke. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, patience to me is is uh, accepting the reality of a situation emotionally. And, and this is the way change is going to be accomplished. It's not going to be accomplished by irritating. Uh, you know, all we have to do is learn from how we deal with teenagers. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> because if you if you're not patient, uh, you're you're only counterproductive. Whatever, whatever you do or say is only counterproductive if you're not being patient. Yeah. Well, I'll give you another one of my analogies that because of my new analogy, self-esteem, I'm going to now say is a 30% good analogy. Mm -hmm. What, you know, we have all these sanctions against Russia and they're for against a very wide variety of things. Some of them are imposed in response to uh, Russian internal affairs where we don't like how the authorities are behaving. Some in response to Russian foreign policy, going into Ukraine, what they've done to Navalny, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's mm -hmm. a very long and broad list. And I ask, what if after George Floyd was killed, China leveled sanctions on us? Right. Right. I mean, can you imagine how we'd respond to that? It would seem absolutely insane mm -hmm. because it's our job to deal with our problems and what happened there. It's not their job to punish us mm -hmm. for, for things that go wrong here. And fundamentally, that has too often been our position in the world, and in particularly with the Soviet Union and Russia. We're going to punish them. And it proves that we can, that we're strong. But how counterproductive was what we did in Ch Cuba? I mean, the, the Castros would not have been in charge within 10 years if we had just let them be Haiti. You know, what, what was, that was all about, we can punish you. Um, and, and the people of Cuba have suffered and, and we have suffered uh, and nobody's gotten any benefit out of that at all. I right. Think. It, it, it probably is some sort of rule of like thermodynamics that it always <laughs> bounces back. Right. If yeah. we had not, if we weren't so devoted to punishing and threatening Russia, maybe they would not be so devoted to interfering in our political system and in our elections. I mm. we don't know that for a fact, but it seems like a reasonable guess. Yeah. And, and as you point out in your book, uh, there's certainly we don't even say we didn't in interfere in the elections in the Ukraine and the Crimea. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we discussed a, a little bit earlier uh, before we got started uh, was how Putin approached the Winter Olympics, you know, and, and uh, trying to say we Russians are Europeans uh, accept us. Look at look at what wonderful things we have done for the European culture. We've we, 
we took French ballet, we made it better. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, 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 we took classical music from the Germans. We put, you know, it's almost like uh, classical music with Russian characteristics. You know? <laughs> uh, and then you get Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff and so on. Um, and, and everybody loves this. Everybody loves this about Russian culture. And, yeah. maybe, you know, we can skip over the communist period of time. But, you know, take us back. We're, we're, we're part of the club. Um, why, don't you, why don't you let us back into the club? And the fact that they were accepting of, of the union with, uh, inside Germany, with uh, the whole history between Germany and Russia and all that, uh, is, is very, a very clear sign that they were willing to try to work with Europe. So it seems like a missed opportunity to, to, to me and to plenty of other people um, that we, we're not responsible for their decisions back against us. We're responsible for our decisions, not making it easy for them to move in the direction that we asked them to move in. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And I think one of my concerns is that it may be too late to go back. I think it's worth trying. Yeah. I think it's worth doing what we can to sort of end the sanctions, end the constant criticism, mm -hmm. end the interference in their affairs, kind of leave them alone and hope that they will return to a little more equanimity towards us as well. Mm -hmm. But also it may be too late. The, the damage may be done. Well, fortunately, we haven't had a major war, you know, between us. And I, I think that's one of the things that, that takes a long time. But even there, in Japan and Germany, we succeeded. And how did we succeed? By how we treated them afterwards. It's that simple. I mean, it's very human. You know, it's like, okay, so inside of a family, there's a big fight. If the, if the family members then treat the person that caused the fight well, it's not perfect. But there's some rapprochement over time and under s very serious, uh, you know, family experiences like marriages or death and stuff like that. The family at least can almost be together. But yeah. if you don't but if you don't allow for the rapprochement, then then there's just a, a major wall and, and people don't talk to each other for 40 years. Yeah. And it's no surprise, really, that it follows very similar dynamics to a family or right. relationships, because it's all just people getting along. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what politics is. That's what foreign affairs is. It's groups of people and it's got that its own sides and its own complexity. But it's still human beings living with each other. Yeah. And, you know, if you don't want to have no hope at all for the future, then you kind of look at people uh, that follow the Yankees and the Red Sox. <laughs> and you say, if these people are willing to feel as strongly as they do about baseball, what are they going to do about something a little bit more important? Right. You know, so, so I, and we, we, are, we are that way emotionally. Yes. Uh, and there's, there's a reason for it. There's some fundamental psychological reasons for it. But that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, get a little bit out of that, that framework. Yep. So let's talk about the Americans. Okay. Um, you, you tell everybody how you came up with this idea. I, I think it's, you know, I mean, obviously extremely popular television show. You were not known for being a television writer or anything before that. And then you come up with your first one or, or whatever that's so successful. Everybody will, that's out there wanting to write is going to ask for the, the secret to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, I mean, I had my own bizarre path. Everybody's path into Hollywood is a little bit different. But, uh, <laughs> I had written a spy novel about a decade after I left the CIA. Mm -hmm. And an agent in Hollywood called me and said, do you want to write for television? Mm -hmm. And I said, I hadn't thought of that, but that sounds like a good idea. I'm broke. I probably wouldn't be as broke if I were writing for television. <laughs> and he spent a long time sort of teaching me how television shows work, which mm -hmm. is not something I had learned. And uh, I ended up writing a, a pilot about a uh, CIA station in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. And it was sold to FX, which was the network that ultimately made the Americans. And they didn't make it, but I got to know them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I sort of started working in TV. And I worked on a, a show called Falling Skies as, mm -hmm. a, as a staff writer, science fiction show. And then in 2010, as I'm sure you remember, there were all these Russian spies arrested right. in the United States. And uh, I think about, I think there were 10 of them. And they were what were known as illegals, mm -hmm. which were spot, they were living in the United States as if they were American citizens. Mm -hmm. Most of them, not all of them most of them. Um, and this is a very bizarre type of espionage that nobody but the Soviets and later Russians really practiced. But I got a call from some people I had worked with who said, why don't you do a show based on this? Uh -huh. And I really wasn't sure at first. I said, let me think about it. I started wandering the streets because something about it, as soon as they were arrested, I thought, what are they, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. 2010, what, what, I mean, I barely believe that espionage does any good in the first place. Right, right, right. A bunch of Russians who don't have any access in America. I just didn't see it. And then I had two thoughts. 
One was that you make the Soviet, the Soviets, the heroes. Mm -hmm. So instead of like a story of FBI chasing these guys, you right. make them, you make them the main characters, which was, in, as you can tell, would right. be of great interest to me. And then I thought, oh, and then you move back to the Cold War, mm -hmm. and now you've now you've got stakes. Uh, yeah. So that was kind of the the genesis of of the of the show. I I don't think I could have remotely predicted that it would have, you know, turned into something. There was a there was a guy uh, in the paper the other day who I think was part of the uh, Catalonian opposition, and he uh -huh. referenced the Americans. <laughs> and I was like, holy cow! Even the first couple of seasons we were making the show. Very few people watched it. Nobody heard of it. Right. And, you know, that it would get to a point someday where a guy like that would, would reference it. I, I, it was really sort of beyond anything I could have uh, imagined. But it was a great, uh, a great experience, a great labor of love. Um, you know, I ran the show with a partner named Joel Fields. We, mm -hmm. you know, spent six years together in the trenches every day. And we had just incredible writers and crew and directors and network. I mean, it was a, television, unlike writing a novel or a nonfiction book, mm -hmm. which is a very solitary activity. And then kind of at the end, you have an editor who helps you at the end. But television is the opposite. It's an enormous, enormous group activity, mm -hmm. uh, which is, it's it's more hectic, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's so rewarding and, and mm -hmm. just a just a great experience. It's interesting how many uh, character actors who were famous from other shows that you guys got into the Americans. Mm -hmm. Were people were people unemployed? Are these people unemployed enough that when you first got started, because how are they know that it was going to become the Americans? You know, I, I recognize one of the guys from The Mentalist, and you know that, that kind of thing. Other quite famous names who who hadn't been around, but all were good actors and, yeah. and were perfect for being older men and, and, and women in these shows. Yeah. Do you, did you have any part of that? Because that, that's a fascinating part of any production is who, who casts them and finds the people. Yeah, yeah. Casting is, is really interesting. And I remember saying to the John Landgraf, who was the head of that, it still is head of the FX network, um, what's the number one thing I can do to screw this up? And he <laughs> said, cast it wrong. <laughs> you know, if you cast it wrong, it just, it just will never, yeah. it will never work. And, uh, fortunately I was surrounded by lots of people who were really good at casting and I, mm. I had time to learn the ropes a little bit myself, but you know, to answer your question more specifically, I think if you look at, you know, Carrie Russell or Matthew Reese or Noah Emmerich or people who sort of were in at the beginning, mm. those are people who all had plenty of opportunities to do anything they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so they sort of roll the dice, right. you know, if they like a script and they, by the way, no matter how much they like a script, they have no idea if you're going to continue making scripts that they like. And that's right. a point because TV, you have to make a lot of scripts over and over in a short period of time. It's very hard to do. So they have to kind of roll the dice based on whatever they, they roll the dice on. Um, but those guys, you know, we we're very fortunate that they all that they all wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And then as you as you sort of go on and you're into your series and you get more of a reputation, well, it's a well-run show. People have a good time on it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's screaming or yelling or, or mistreating <laughs> anybody. People and pick shows for that reason. I, I think it, <laughs> I think it, I think yeah. it is part of it. Look, obviously there are always going to be some people who need <laughs> work and will take any job, understandably. Right. But also we had plenty of people who could be who could be choosy right. and chose it because they were they were interested in the work. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, um, I think I'll end on this. You, you, you didn't expect the Americans to do what it did. Yeah. Okay. Now, you don't have really high hopes that people will take on your foreign policy ideas, <laughs> but maybe the ideas in Russia Upside Down will become very popular 15 years from now, and everybody will be just as happy with you as they are about the Americans. Well, I'll just, I'll just conclude by saying you'd be shocked how close that is to my actual fantasy. <laughs> like, I really, I, you know, because when I was younger and I was very eager to have some kind of big success, and so all my fantasies were about big, big success. Mm -hmm. I think I've, I had a big success with a TV show. It was very satisfying. I'm sort of sated a little yeah. bit. And my fantasy for this book is that like 15 years from now, there are like a couple of college classes mm. around the country that kind of read it. Mm. And I think, oh, that'd be great. Especially if one of the students becomes Secretary of State 15 years later. Oh, that would <laughs> <laughs> Better yet. Anyway, that's the way ideas work. And it was a great contribution to the hope that we can make this work a little bit smarter. Thanks Thank a lot, Joe. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. So ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you again.